So we are saying that uh, existence is, co is coexistence, it's in harmony. But when we uh, study the thermodynamics, this entropy of the universe is continuously increasing. So that means more and more disorderly state, more and more chaos. So that becomes something contradictory. So could you explain that a little bit? <clears throat> In fact, this is, you know, these are many of these uh, so-called laws of nature. You know, I think we have to revisit. Okay. So, rather than uh, giving answers to, I mean, these questions relating to many of these laws which have been described, you know, what I would uh, propose is more of uh, you know some of the possibilities of looking at these things you know in a much wider perspective than what we are doing today <clears throat> so for example this uh, law you know which uh, I mean, it is stated as a law but uh, i will take it as a statement <clears throat> the statement says that the entropy of the universe is ever increasing. <clears throat> and it is talking about the universe right, as a whole. But the way I would look at it is that does this statement apply to the units belonging to all the four orders in nature or is it specifically being talked about in the context of the units belonging to physical order only? Right. So that is one question that we have to ask ourselves. Because if you look at the units belonging to this plant, you know, bio order, a plant, for example, you know, or a human body, for example, right. When this plant is taking its food from the soil and assimilating it as part of it, you know, nurturing of this, of the plant. Now, what is happening? Is this orderliness, is this self-organization is increasing or decreasing? Increasing. Yeah, and entropy, which is defined as, you know, increase of disorderliness or chaos. <clears throat> so will it, will that, this statement apply to the mm -hmm. case of plant order or the bio order and plant being one example of it. So I'm just posing this as a, you know, possibility to look into this, you know, many of these statements which have been made you know, uh, and considered as laws of nature. So they may apply to a very particular area or they have been investigated in a particular area and then they have been generalized. And of course, they are not taking into account the unit of consciousness. So we have this physical order and we have this bio order, right? And then we have this consciousness, right? Mm -hmm. Involved in animal order and human order. Now, most of these uh, studies have been conducted in the area of physical order. Very few in the area of, you know, bio order. And the concept of consciousness is not even there. You know. And the consciousness being one of the unit in nature, we have to have this, you know, study it. So I would say that this law that entropy is increasing or ever increasing in the universe, okay, we have to keep ourselves open to this and ask this question whether it applies to all the units in nature 
or only to you know, units belonging to the physical order and not belonging to the you know bio order or the consciousness that is animal in the human order and even for a physical order does it apply to all units belonging to physical order hmm. <clears throat> so my conjecture would be that uh, in case of bio order this bio order has the capacity to reorganize things around you know it and assimilate it as part of the you know this uh, bio order right so a cell for example would assimilate you know so many things from the environment and multiply itself right so from one cell you know it will build up another cell and then multiply you know into two cells right now this cell is such an organized you know system there is so much of uh, and totally it is not chaotic it is not chaotic mm. if you look at this very design of nature of existence it is that of harmony order and coexistence not of disharmony chaos and struggle this digested food become becoming a part of the whole plant is certainly getting more organized more in harmony with the plant than before so overall whether the orderliness the harmony is increasing or decreasing this we have to look deeper and try to understand now when it comes to human being what is naturally acceptable to us harmony yeah harmony or disharmony order or disorder chaos order so while going through this process of self exploration we have been able to see you know that we have this uh, harmony at all the you know the first three orders right the physical order the bio order and the animal order and when it comes to human being human being also has this natural acceptance for harmony and human being can also be in harmony by way of understanding the harmony right in nature in existence and living in harmony with it so the very design of nature of existence is that of harmony of order and coexistence not of disharmony chaos and struggle so in the light of this we have to relook at this statement that we have made the entropy of universe is continuously increasing so i will open it as a question rather than as a statement of fact and i would say that if we look at the nature and if we try to understand the harmony the you know coexistence in nature in existence then what appears is that there is harmony there is coexistence there is relationship right there is orderliness and not the chaos right? and the human being who is trying to you know understand this existence this nature has to understand this harmony only when he is able to see this harmony understand this harmony this coexistence that he is he is able to live in harmony in coexistence in absence of this understanding of harmony the human being tends to see things in opposition in contradiction in struggle and once it is assuming that there is disharmony there is struggle there is opposition then it starts seeing this chaos this you know contradiction this struggle everywhere 
it, because it is after all the human being who is trying to study, you know, and share this knowledge or absence of knowledge with other human being. So if there is a lack on the part of the human being in understanding this harmony, then he might see this chaos, this struggle, this you know, opposition everywhere. And that is what we are doing, you know, as uh, modern man, that we are not able to see the harmony, we are not able to see the relationship, we are not able to see the coexistence. Right? Rather, we feel that there is so much of opposition, there is so much of struggle, there is so much of chaos. Right? And therefore, we see everything, you know, even the physical order and the bio order and the animal order as being in opposition, being in chaos, being in struggle. So I think we have to relook at it. You have to relook at it and make a deeper study into the existence, into the nature, and see whether there is harmony or there is chaos. And whether this harmony is ever increasing or it is you know, the chaos which is ever increasing. Mm. So rather than giving answer to this question, I will open it for you know our self-exploration, for deeper investigation. Mm. Yes. Yeah, I mean, it just uh, brings to light how much, you know, we need to relook at so many of the things that we are teaching and learning from so many years. And I think, you know, our perspective, with our perspective, we uh, look at it so differently. Yeah. Um, yeah. <clears throat> so what we have been doing right from the beginning that we have to do a very systematic study into ourself, human being, and into the nature and existence through this process of self-exploration, right? where we can investigate regarding any you know, proposal whether it is naturally acceptable to us or not, and whether it is leading to mutual happiness and mutual prosperity or not. Mm. So, if we do this self-exploration, we can go deeper and deeper into, you know, the nature, into the units in nature, into the space, right? <clears throat> and see the subtler and subtler things. Mm. Today we are quite used to see only things at a gross level, you know, gross physical level. But that's not all the reality is. The reality is, of course, you know, gross also. But then there are subtler and subtler realities that are there and we need to understand them. And that is what we are trying to do step by step. Yeah. Um, what would you say about time? <clears throat> yeah, this is another concept, you know, many of these concepts have to be reopened, you know, and looked into. Okay. Now, this notion of time is again defined with respect to the world, you know, or the realities which are changing in time. So, for example, the earth is going around the sun and there is this process of change taking place and you observe that change right? and you define <coughs> this change in a phenomena right? as some basic reference for time. Right. Mm -hmm. So the time is defined with respect to this phenomena of change. Right. That's the way the time is defined. <clears throat> but 
if you look at the whole reality now okay, as we have tried to understand in terms of the material units and in terms of the consciousness units which are submerged in space then we have to define time in the light of all this today this time is defined only with respect to the material world where there is change in the phenomena this material world is of the type of you know changing right it keeps changing its form from one to the other and when this form is being is changing then with respect to that change we are defining the time So what we are proposing again is that this time has to be defined in respect of two different types of realities. Right? One which is not changing with time and another which is changing with time. Presently we are defining only with respect to the one which is changing with time. So what we are saying is that when we are talking <coughs> with respect to reality which is not changing with time then we can only say that it is ever present with respect to time so this is interesting you know? so there is one notion of time where you are defining things which are ever present with respect to time but there again this ever present has a notion of time right but it is not defined with respect to something which is changing with time so this nitya vartaman you know, this ever present <coughs> is something which is running through all that is changing So if you look at the uh, Indian tradition, for example, you know, we have both this notion of time, you know, notion of Kal. <clears throat> so when you say Kalo na Yati, this, you know, it, it is saying that time is not passing away. Right? But these phenomena are passing away. So there is one, this absolute notion of time. <clears throat> And there's a whole lot of you know, things related to this. You know, this notion of Mahakal, you know, is this time which is not changing, you know, which is not defined with respect to things which are changing. You know, it is there and it is defined in terms of something being ever present. So this is one notion of time which is defined with respect to something which is not changing with time something which is permanent. Right? On the other hand, when we are talking with respect to reality which is changing with time, then we can talk about time with respect to change in that reality. For example, if the earth is evolving around the sun, we can define one revelation of earth around the sun as one unit of time. In this case, it is called an year, you know. Mm. Year is one unit of time which is defined with respect to revolution of the earth around the sun. So this is a changing phenomena with respect to which the time is defined, or the unit of time is defined. Similarly, if a pendulum is oscillating, we can define one oscillation of pendulum as one unit of time. For example, one second and so on. <clears throat> but we have to open it, you know, and open it for both say, phenomena which are not changing with time or the realities which are not changing with time and reality with, which are changing with time. So this notion of ever present is also very important. This is ever present with respect to time. And that provides the base 
that runs through all the phenomena or the realities which are changing. So there is a whole lot of this exploration, you know, or investigation or studies, you know, to look at the many of the traditions, you know, an Indian tradition being one of them, where they are trying to study about this, you know, the one which is not changing with time and the one which is changing with time. And the one which is not changing with time, which is ever present, okay, is seen as the basis or the subtle aspect of this gross reality, which is changing with time. So even when we try to understand this gross reality, which is changing with time, we have to look into this subtler reality, right, subtler and subtler reality, right, which is not changing with time. And they are coexisting. The gross is existing. The subtler is also, you know, existing, and the subtlest one is also existing. And they are the subtlest, you know, <coughs> kind of reality is what is called as primordial, you know, reality. So there is a lot of investigation about that. We'll talk about that sometime, but what I'm saying is that this notion of ever present is there, which we have to understand. And this notion of changing you know, is also there. That also we have to understand. So when we are defining time, we have to define time with respect to both, right? This notion of ever present and this notion of time, you know, which is defined with respect to reality, which are changing. <clears throat> in fact, what instead of giving answers to your questions, I'm trying to open up, you know, this things for deeper investigation. And many of these issues have already been, you know, studied in many of the traditions mm. in a much better, much deeper manner than what we are doing today. Yes. Right. This notion of Mahat, for example, this Mahat Tattva, it says, you know, that there is this space, you know, which is all pervading, okay, which is no activity that we were talking about yesterday. And then you have this subtlest activity, you know, the subtlest activity, okay, which is there, okay, which may not be identified or identifiable by the self, by the consciousness as an unit or as an organized unit, but it can be identified as some activity. Right? And that is this, you know, this coexistence of this no activity or the the subtlest activity, you know, and the no activity is what is the primordial, you know, kind of uh, thing in nature. And that is what is called as Mahat. <clears throat> now this, I mean, one of the tradition calls it as Mahat. So this Mahat has to be understood. Right. And then in, on the basis of this Mahat, okay, this primordial uh, reality okay, of the subtlest activity being in uh, no activity or being submerged in no activity is what is the building block of all the activity that we see, the grosser and grosser activities that we see is built up with this. And that remains, you know, unchanged. So at that level, there is no, you know, creation or destruction. destruction. In fact, all creation and destruction is taking place on the basis of this. So all this we have to open up and see. Yes, 
I think this is what I would place for further exploration. Yes. Then again, you know, there is this law of impermanence that, that, that is spoken of. So again, that also uh, sort of goes against this ever-present, unchanging. Yeah, in fact, same, you know, kind of uh, thing mm. you will find all around, you know, that there are these three basic realities. You know. One is the units of material, which are changing with time. Then you have the units of consciousness. And then we have this space, right? The no activity, okay, which is there, ever present, you know, which is all, you know, all pervading. Now, most of our studies are focused on these units of material. Number one. Number two, even if we are talking about the consciousness or unit of consciousness, we are only focusing on those activities of consciousness, which are of the nature of changing. We are not really working or investigating into the activities of the self, of the consciousness, which are of the nature of being definite, or which are of the nature of being, you know, kind of unchanging. Mm. And of course, we are not talking about the space. So here again, I mean, I would uh, kind of kind of place the possibility. <clears throat> so what I'm saying, you know, what is uh, being said is that there is impermanence in the units of material as its form itself is changing, right? Its mm -hmm. form, its structure itself is changing. Right? Yes. So, <clears throat> yes, when you look at the units of material, they are impermanent in nature because their form, their structure itself is changing. So it gets you know, transformed from one structure to another structure, to one state, from one state to another state. Right. So for example, if you um, look at water, you know, if temperature goes down, it can con get converted into ice. If temperature goes up, it can be converted into, you know, the vapor. And if you uh, pass an electric, you know, kind of, uh, uh, current through it, at some time it can break into hydrogen and oxygen and things like that, you know. So that impermanence is there. <clears throat> but when it comes to human, comes to the unit of consciousness, right, its structure is not changing. You know. It remains to be there okay, as an unit and does not get converted into some other unit. <clears throat> so this impermanence in terms of structure is not there. Right? So its form is continuous in time. But if you look at the activities of this consciousness, this self, we have, you know, different levels of activity that we have been talking about. <clears throat> and we have seen that this lower, you know, uh, level of activities, what we are calling as imagination, under which we have this desire, thought and expectation. These activities may be of the nature of changing. So the structure remains the same. It's being, you know, as an unit of consciousness remains the same, but the activities may be changing. So there again, you can have this impermanence, right? in terms of the activity, not in terms of the structure. <clears throat> so this imagination may keep changing unless it is guided by the higher activity of the self, particularly the activity of realization. 
So this is what we have been studying that when you look at the activity of realization, where I can see the you know space and see the submergence of units in space. There, there is continuity. There is no change. And one of the expression of this is what we are seeing as natural acceptance. So our natural acceptance remains the same. You know, it is something which is innate, something which is invariant, something which is not changing with time and place and individual. So this is something which is definite, which is certain and which is continuous, right? And there is no change. Mm. So there is permanence at the level of activity of realization. And when it comes to a space, <clears throat> which is no activity, right? there is no possibility of change anyway, because change is taking place only in the activity or can take place only in the activity. But the space, which is no activity, right? there is no possibility of change. So it is permanent in its very you know, uh, being. And this space is invariant over both time and space. So now when you look at this impermanence, this impermanence will apply to the units of material at the level of structure, at the level of form itself. This will apply or not apply to the unit of consciousness in terms of its form, in terms of its structure, but it can still apply at the level of activities, particularly the lower activities of the self. However, when it comes to the highest activity of the self, that is realization, right? That remains unchanging with time. So in that sense, it is permanent. And it also does not apply this impermanence to space, right? which is not an activity. <clears throat> so you can see this space is ever present in all time, in all space. This self, this consciousness is ever present in terms of its form, in terms of its structure. This activity of realization, the highest activity of this self is also, you know, ever present or is unchanging with respect to time. It is not ever present with respect to space, but it is ever present with respect to time. So in that sense, it is permanent. So the many units of materials are impermanent. The units of consciousness in terms of structure it is permanent. But in terms of activity, it may be changing. But even in terms of activity, the highest activity of realization is unchanging. So it is permanent. And space is, of course, permanent, is ever present with respect to time. It is, of course, over, ever present even with respect to the space. So we have to revisit this statement that everything is impermanent. Yes. Certain things are impermanent in existence. Certain things are permanent in existence. Yeah, maybe it means in fact, things. In fact, there is a very interesting, you know, this um, this notion of continuous happiness basically relates to this. That as long as we are trying to get happiness through something which is not of the nature of being permanent, right? We are likely to get into trouble. Right. If we want continuity of happiness, then ultimately we have to found this uh, happiness on things which are permanent. So this happiness has to be founded in 
understanding in realization right realization which has this notion notion of being you know permanent with respect to time so if my notion of my you know happiness is based on this realization of coexistence then it can be continuous so realization of coexistence realization of space which, which itself is permanent both with respect to time and space if my happiness is based on that realization of coexistence realization of space and these are you know of the nature of permanent in time with respect to time then my happiness can be continuous continuous in time and this is what we have been trying to you know kind of uh, reach to the conclusion you know at that ultimately our need for continuous happiness is fulfilled through realization realization of coexistence realization of space and if we are basing our happiness on anything lesser than this right anything which is changing with time we will be in trouble so in this chart the uh, even in the consciousness part there is something which is ever present also i mean it's not changing in time that realization activity yeah so this <clears throat> in consciousness you know this unit of consciousness as i was saying its structure is not changing its form oh, is not changing you know it remains you know, to be for example if you look at the self and the body right the structure of the body or the constitution of the body right keeps changing it was a small you know at the time of birth then it becomes bigger and bigger but the structure the form of the self does not change it remains unchanged and there again what we are saying is that many of these activities of imagination that was there you know they keep changing that you can observe but your natural acceptance for example is not changing whether you are a, when you were a young boy right you had natural acceptance for relationship and not opposition when you become an old man as far as the self is concerned it might have collected a lot of imaginations in between but as far as the natural acceptance is concerned it remains the same so first the structure of the self or the being of the self continues to be there right it is not changing its form its structure it's not becoming something else second thing is that this natural acceptance remains unchanged you know it is invariant remains you know unchanged with respect to time where is the low activities the lower activities of the self might change yes. so at yes. early age you know you, you might have a uh, kind of expectation for toys now after some time they become irrelevant but as far as this acceptance natural acceptance for relationship is concerned right it does not change mm. right so that natural acceptance that we have been talking about which is at the level of this realization it is not changing so we must you know kind of appreciate that and make that as the basis for all our decision right and that is what we have been doing right from the first day we are saying you know we have to explore through this process of you know self verification and the first verification is to check with respect to our natural acceptance which is invariant invariant with respect to time which is inert intact invariant so that is something permanently there in us 
and only that can be the basic reference. So ultimately, this realization of coexistence and realization of the space is what is what can be the basis for continued happiness. Right. That means the context of the statement is something uh, maybe misunderstood. The context of the statement is not that everything that exists is impermanent. The yes. context of the statement is that if we are trying to draw happiness out of things which are uh, of a nature which is impermanent, that uh, uh, will not give continuous happiness. Is that kind of... Yes, yes. That is that is the statement which have been made, you know, all over and over again. In fact, yes. most of these um, scriptures that uh, you see, you know, uh, in many of these uh, philosophies, uh, they are saying, uh, I mean, for example, Buddhism, if you see, you know, uh, what it is saying is that, you know, you cannot base your uh, state of uh, continuous happiness or state of bliss okay, on something which is not permanent. And most of the things that you are trying to base your happiness on are impermanent. Right? And therefore it will not work. Now this is a very, uh, you know, right, a very kind of uh, important statement. So what it is not, what it is saying is not that there is nothing permanent. But what it is saying is that all that you are occupied with for your happiness are not permanent in nature. And therefore you cannot get permanent happiness out of it. But therefore it is not saying that there is no state of continuous happiness or no state of, you know, permanent bliss. In fact, it is essentially talking about that. The basic thrust of uh, Buddhism is that you can be in a state of bliss, which is ever present, you know, which is continuous in time. But then you cannot rely on things, right, which are changing in nature as the base for your continuity of happiness, for the, you know, base, uh, as the base for your state of bliss. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, so what it is saying is that you have to get to something which is not changing. Right? Which is not changing, which is permanent. And one thing which is permanent is certainly the space. Right? Certainly the space. So then space comes to play a very significant role. And this space is a reality. It is not something, you know, which is absence of reality. So that sunya means absence of activity, not absence of a reality. But generally it is interpreted as absence of reality. So this kriya sunya, you know, this no activity is a reality, which we have to understand. And this can be the foundation for our continuous of, continuity of happiness. So this space, this no activity and the realization of this no activity. Right? And then realization of this, you know, fact that all activities are taking place in this no activity is what is the, is what is the basis of uh, this state of bliss. <laughs> yeah, there is this uh, question that um, 
if everything is going to end, then why go through all the trouble? And why not just go with, have fun and enjoy? But yeah. uh, I think it is already answered. <laughs> Yeah, in fact, now we have the basic, you know, understanding to look into these statements, you know, whether they are, you know, complete or incomplete, whether they apply to all the cases or they don't apply to all the cases. We already have something at the back of our mind, right? We have some conception about the reality, about the existence, about the nature, about the human being. And with that conception, Right? We are making all these statements. Right? Mm. So this is one such statement that everything is going to end. <laughs> anyway, right? Which is, which may not be true. Mm. Right? And that is what we are saying. We should open up all these, you know, statements for further investigation. So if we look at it, we can see that not everything is going to end, right? So as we have already explained, the unit of consciousness continues to be right in its form. And depending on whether its lower activities are guided by realization or not, it is in a state of harmony or, and happiness, or in a state of contradiction and unhappiness. Mm. Right. So the self continues to be there, the consciousness continues to be there. Right, this unit of consciousness. And there we can see you know, that though the body will come to an end, but this continues, this consciousness will continue to be there. And there what is important is whether these lower activities of the self are in line with the highest activity you know, of this self, mm. that is realization or not. If it is in line with this realization, this activity of highest activity of realization, then we are in a state of harmony and happiness. On the other hand, if these lower activities of the self are not in line with this, or not guided by this realization, the highest activity of the self, then we'll be in a state of contradiction and a state of unhappiness. Right. Mm -hmm. So if we desire for happiness in continuity, we have to keep working on first awakening to this activity of realization, okay. this highest activity of the self, and ensuring that lower activities are in line with it or are guided by it, with it. So that will be a state of joy, a state of bliss. Otherwise, we suffer in the hope of joy. Mm -hmm. So this last statement, just enjoy and be merry. This enjoy, ultimately we want to be in a state of joy in continuity. Right? But we have expectation for it. And what we are doing to have this continuity of joy is we are relying on things which are not continuous, you know, which are not permanent in nature. And that is the trouble. So, if you want to enjoy, if you want to enjoy really, enjoy in continuity and be merry, what we have to do is to understand this space, this all pervading space, right? Understand our own, you know, this highest activity of realization, right? And one way to access this is what we have been calling you know, as natural acceptance from the beginning. So access this activity of realization, the highest activity of realization of the self. And then make this as the guide for lower activities of the self. Mm. If that happens, then we are in a state of harmony within. We are in a state of happiness within. And we can be in a state of joy, a state of bliss in continuity. So we are not saying that you suffer. You are already suffering. 
in the hope of joy mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. and this hope is you know you think can be fulfilled by you know the material things you know, or getting sensation through material things or getting some feeling from others so you work for joy with the hope of joy and you end up suffering what is being suggested is that there is a possibility of joy in continuity so you can really enjoy okay. hmm. if you can understand the self the consciousness you know the highest activity of consciousness that is realization and there you can understand this space and the coexistence right? this coexistence this harmony this relationship and if you ensure that all your lower activities are guided by this realization then you can be in a state of harmony and happiness in continuity you can be in a state of joy a state of bliss <laughs> Hmm. Actually, but what is happening is otherwise, right? Yeah. You have hope of joy, and you end up suffering hmm. because you are trying to found your um, kind of joy on something which is not permanent. Hmm. In fact, this has been the major concern. You know, if you formulate most of this philosophy, you know. of different traditions what it is saying is that yes this is accepted that we all want to be in a state of joy state of happiness but what is going to be the source of this continuous happiness this joy this state of bliss can it be something which is permanent with respect to time or can it not be something which is permanent in not permanent in time or which is permanent in time so this is the question right and this wisdom is defined in this context the wisdom is to be able to differentiate between what is permanent and what is not permanent so what is permanent is called nitya what is not permanent is called anitya so this nitya anitya vivek is something which is very fundamental this wisdom to differentiate between what is permanent and what is not permanent with respect to time so something which is not going to change time something which is permanent is not going to end not going to end and we have to see what we have to do you know because it is anyway going to be there so with that what do we do so the consciousness is not changing with time you know as far as its form its structure is concerned so it will continue to be in its form right then these activities might be changing so how can you make this activity is also definite so then you have to get to this realization the activity of realization which is of nature of permanent and then the space which is of the nature of permanent so these two things have to be understood you know and on the basis of understanding of that and on the basis of ensuring that this realization becomes the guide for all the lower activities of the self okay. we can be in a state of harmony and happiness in continuity mm -hmm. so this whole idea of having this wisdom to differentiate between what is permanent and what is not permanent that is number 1 number 2 is that then we try to plan all our living on the basis of what is permanent right and second slowly we try to get rid of all our dependency on things which are not permanent so interestingly you know this vivek with this vivek of what is right and what what is permanent and what is not permanent then trying to live with what is permanent is what is called as abhyas 
and to get rid of what is not permanent or living with something which is not permanent is called vairagya. So very simple thing, you know, that first I have to have the understanding, the knowledge, the realization through which I can see what is permanent and what is not permanent. So I have that wisdom. With that wisdom, I practice for living in accordance with what is permanent or under the guide of what is permanent. And slowly get rid of my old habits of trying to get happiness through something which is not permanent. That is that can be the source of joy and marry, right? Continuous <laughs> joy and marry that we are anyway looking for. Mm. Yeah. So yeah, please go ahead. Yes, sir. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Uh, just Good morning. after listening to uh, today's discussion content about uh, what is permanent and what is uh, temporary, when we say moksha. Uh, moksha prapti. Is it that uh, the soul or the conscious, uh, the self, uh, stays in uh, with uh, in a, a state of no activity? That is what is called moksha, or what? And second uh, thing is about uh, uh, we are coexistence of material and uh, self. So uh, there has to be some. Uh, organ which will connect this material to non-material and uh, that is what we uh, have uh, known yet is a mind and mind has got three different uh, levels conscious subconscious and super conscious and what we i know or i have uh, learned is this super conscious mind it remains with the soul uh, as long as we keep uh, taking uh, uh, means we keep coming uh, again and again with different bodies that is what is uh, called as rebirth or what so uh, and all the memories of whatever we learn in each uh, time uh, with uh, in coexistence that remains uh, in this uh, super conscious uh, super conscious mind or it is also called sukshma sharir so uh, I just wanted to know about these things. Yeah. So this is interesting, you know. This moksha and uh, you know the bandhan and moksha. So if I put it in a simple way, what it means is that when I'm trying to get happiness from something which is not permanent, then I end up, you know, getting frustrated. I end up in suffering, right, which I do not want. So this is the bondage. This is the bandhan that I want to be happy and I'm working for my happiness and I end up suffering. Right. And therefore I want to get the freedom from this suffering. So when I get this freedom from the suffering, then I'm liberated. Liberated from this suffering which I did not want ever. I wanted happiness and I worked for happiness right? and I ended up suffering. So I don't want this. I want to be liberated from this. Right. So moksha would essentially mean liberation from all this suffering, all this unhappiness, which I do not want. Right. So this is one way of looking at moksha looking at liberation, right? liberation from suffering, liberation from unhappiness. The other way of looking at it could be ensuring continuity of happiness. 
right? so I am able to ensure continuity of happiness. Okay, so this is what we have been talking about. If you look at this whole thing that we have been talking about all through, we are talking about how to ensure living with continuous happiness. That is what is desirable. And if we are able to ensure this living with continuous happiness, we will anyway get rid of the suffering. And this living with continuous happiness is what we are saying is the <coughs> ultimate desirable state for all of us. And that is the state of Satantrata. We want to be happy and we are happy. So we want to be in a state of satantrata where this moksha will be included. At least we want not to suffer. So that liberation is desirable, at least. But at most, we want to live with satantrata, live with a state of continuous happiness. Now, the study into this, you know, there has been a whole lot of study, you know, in all religions, in all philosophy about this, you know, how to ensure continuity of happiness, how to get rid of suffering. So getting rid of suffering is a part of this Satantrata, where you are able to ensure living with continuous happiness. So what is being said in a sense, and many things have been said, but one important thing has been that if your happiness is based on something which is not permanent in nature, then you will end up suffering. Then you will end up suffering because there is no possibility of continuity in it. So you cannot have continuity of happiness on the basis of something which itself is not continuous. So there is a lot of saying about this, you know, that if you are trying to get happiness from sensation, right, this sensation itself is not continuous in time. Therefore, this cannot be the source of continuous happiness. So you are bound to frustrate. You want to suffer. So if you want to get happiness out of the good taste of the food, then you cannot ensure continuity of happiness through eating food, tasty food, because after some time your stomach will get full and you cannot eat anymore. Or even if you keep on eating, the thing that you are eating might get consumed. You know? So there is a whole lot of this, um, you know, thing that is being said. So in a sense, what is being said is that if you are basing your happiness on something which is not permanent, then you are bound to suffer because that continuity of happiness will not be there. So whether it is in terms of physical things, whether in terms of consuming, you know, the, uh, these physical things that is having this, you know, favorable sensations, right, or getting the feeling from other all these are not permanent in nature. Therefore, you are likely to get into trouble. You are likely to suffer. I don't want to suffer. I want to get rid of this suffering. Right? That is moksha. And now what we are saying is that what we can do is probably to understand what is permanent and what is not permanent and then base our happiness on something which is permanent right? and not on something which is not permanent, then we can ensure being in a state of harmony and happiness in continuity. Right? And then we will be free from misery. So this state of moksha will be a part of this you know, uh, being in you know, to live with something which is permanent and ensuring continuity of happiness. And you can see that what we have been saying is that to ensure continuity of happiness, we have to have the right understanding right? and we have to have the right feeling and thought in the self. And that will ensure continuity of happiness. 
So what we are saying essentially, in a sense, that this right understanding can be something permanent, right? So that activity of realization and under the guidance of that realization, we have this understanding and contemplation. Then this can be there permanent, something definite, not changing with time. And if this becomes the guide for our feeling, then our feeling will also become definite, permanent. And because this is now definite and permanent, this can be the source of continuous happiness. So the right understanding and right feeling can be the source of continuous happiness because once we have the right understanding and we have the feeling based on this right understanding, then we'll have this right feeling also in continuity. And that can be the base of continuous happiness. And what cannot be this base of continuous happiness is the sensation through the physical facility or getting feeling from others. So something which is not of nature or permanent cannot be the source of happiness for impermanence. If we try to make something impermanent as the basis for our source of happiness, then we are getting into trouble. We'll end up in suffering, end up in frustration, in depression and all that. So this is the moksha, meaning of moksha and satantrata and bandhan. But this is one of the interpretations about uh, what you know the traditions have been saying. But basic part of what is being said, you know, the part one is that something which is not permanent cannot be the source of permanent happiness. And second is that something which is permanent can be the source of permanent happiness. These are the two parts of you know, most of what is being said in the scriptures of different philosophy and different religions. Namaste, sir. Namaste. Uh, sir, uh, what I want to ask is, uh, uh, for some time ago, I have been reading uh, some dohas written by Sant Kabir. Uh, so what I could understand from that was uh, what we have been discussing uh, with this subject, it was there in his living. Uh, so why it is not coming to us like that? I am not questioning about our efforts in understanding, but then uh, even if uh, we are putting efforts, uh, the things are uh, not grasped by me uh, the way I expect them to. So then uh, I have this fear that whether I'll be able to do it and it is not getting reflected in my life. Then uh, there was session arranged in our college uh, as part of SIP, uh, which was Sahaj Yoga session. So in that, uh, the method which they guided was of 10 minutes and we have to surrender to mother nature saying we need to achieve that state of self-realization. Then I was like, if it is that simple, uh, which way we should follow? But Ultimately, I want to reach that state where I can uh, get this understanding both. Uh, yes, sir, this much from my side. So was I able to put it clearly? Uh, yeah, I, mean, I uh, can leave. Uh, um, I can rephrase your question. And check whether this is what you are asking. Uh, what you are asking is that we have you know, so many right proposals around 
us, whether it is in the form of, you know, some uh, Doha from Kabir or any other form. But we are not able to understand them and we are not able to ensure, you know, that those things in our life. Right? So what do we do? Is that your question? Yes, yes, sir. Yeah. So this is what we have been saying right from the beginning, you know, that uh, we as human being has this possibility of knowing and assuming right? and then recognizing and fulfilling. And this assuming can be based on, on, based on knowing or without knowing. So, <clears throat> if, if you look at this society, and if you look at the way society goes on, with knowledge or without knowledge, it has some assumptions, right? And with those assumptions, it is recognizing and fulfilling the relationship around. Okay. And this young generation, you know, the children who are coming up, they take this as something given as truth. Okay. And they try to imitate, they try to follow and all that, you know, that we have been discussing about the process of education. And then this basic assumptions, which are accepted in the society, they go on multiplying, you know, they go on you know, continuing from one generation to another generation. And this is what is happening with each one of us. Now, what we are saying is that it is the role of education, whether it is given in the schools and colleges or in the you know, family or in the society, the role of education is to try, you know, introduce the process in which understanding starts playing a significant role. That rather than taking the assumption as given truth, right, we have to have a process of, you know, investigating into the reality and understanding the reality ourselves. And as we have been saying, that phase comes, you know, if you look at the child, it starts with imitating and following, but it wants to know, it wants to understand. Right? So when this child wants to understand, we should facilitate through our education system, right? Facilitate the child to explore and know for himself or herself. So what I would say is that this is missing, you know, this is largely missing in our education today, whether in the school colleges or in the family or in the society. So this is what we need to do. And this is what we are saying right from the beginning that this process of education, at least the process of value, value education you know, would be this self-exploration, the self-investigation through which I can see things for myself, through which I can understand myself, right? Understand about the whole existence by the process of this self-exploration. So, if we do this, then over a period of time, yes, we can improve our education system in the schools and colleges then in the family, then in the society and so on. Okay. So this is what we need to do. Otherwise, we are going by assumption, generation after generation, without exploration, without investigation, without knowing. Right. And when we don't know, we have, you know, we don't have that confidence in us, number one. Okay. Number two, we may not have the exact details. We may not have the exact details or we may even have assumptions which are contradictory. Which are contradictory. And when they are contradictory assumptions, then I'm not able to resolve them unless I know about the reality. 
so this is all that is happening you know around for example this you know uh, what uh, uh, professor was just asking you know about this moksha right? now many of us in our tradition have this in the background that we have to get moksha right? and then under the influence of modernity many of us think that we should accumulate you know more and more right so unlimited wealth we must accumulate now these two if i assume both of them to be my you know aim then i will always be in contradiction with him so when i am working to accumulate more and more right by any means then i keep worrying about what will happen to moksha my liberation and when i am working for liberation i keep worrying about what will happen to my that you know accumulating more and more so this is what is happening number 1 we are going by assumption without a process of self verification without a process of knowing right this is one problem that we are facing okay. and second thing is that we have assumptions which we have not verified but which are also contradictory in nature and therefore we are not able to resolve so in either case we keep suffering so you hear some of the dohas of kabir and one level it seems you know that it is good and you must you know uh, realize this and be with it but then there are other assumptions which say that you know you have other things to do so forget about it and then you forget about it that is what is happening so what we are therefore trying is that it should be made part of the main stream education if it happens you know then at least this generation will be able to get you know into this process of self verification process of understanding right and after some time these students will become the parents right the responsible member of the society in that case we will have this you know in due course of time in next one or two generation in the family and in the society so that is how it can work but this is all you know kind of uh guess at least we have been able to introduce it in the professional education and it seems to be working it seems to be working for the you know um educational institution it seems to be working with the teachers the staff their family the students yes but we have to take care of this number 1 we have to explore within to understand what is right and number 2 we have to work for updating our own accumulation right of sanskar accumulation of our desire thought and expectation so we have to evaluate them and we have to set them right which may take time yes it will take time to complete but you can immediately begin you know with it you can immediately begin with it yes uh yes sir uh now what i can see is uh that updating uh, is uh, not correctly happening i am able to see things but then uh exploration is happening to very little extent and then i am trying to update uh, with that little exploration and then confusion is there 
maybe i need to stop update yeah. uh, explore first then update and then again start with uh, one thing at a time maybe mm -hmm. thank you so much sir thank you for everything uh ganesh ji namaskar namaste गणेश जी नमस्कार पराशर दसाई कैसे हैं आप यस गुड स्मॉल डाउट ड्यूरिंग योर ड्यूरिंग योर डिस्कशन टूडे व्हेन यू वर एक्सप्लेन टू अस द टाइम द कांसेप्ट ऑफ टाइम यू सेड दैट बॉडी इज चेंजिंग विद रिस्पेक्ट टू टाइम व्हिच इज करेक्ट एब्सोल्युटली करेक्ट बट यू आल्सो सेड दैट द सेल्फ इज नॉट चेंजिंग विद रिस्पेक्ट टू टाइम Uh, my small doubt is uh, uh, maybe from the student's point of view, uh, self is consciousness. Now my consciousness at the level of uh, my uh, you know when I was five years old, my consciousness and my consciousness level at uh, when I was fifteen years old or twenty five years old was definitely different. So uh, how do we say that uh, the self is not changing? I think uh, the consciousness level. it uh, changes with respect to time or with respect to age maybe at some time probably the rate of uh, consciousness may probably change but it is changing am i right yeah what i said was i mean i can repeat i said the consciousness the self is not changing in its form in its structure number 1 number 2 the lower activities of the self are still changing right unless it is guided by this highest activity of realization so i will reiterate what i said i said this natural acceptance for example does not change yeah that is correct yes so this is one activity the highest activity of the self which is not changing but the lower activities of the self may be guided by this or may not be guided by this if it is not guided by this then they may keep changing yes that is what we are trying to do you know we are trying to be aware of this highest activity of this self and then we are trying to make sure that lower activities of this self are guided by this highest activity of this self right and one thing that we can access from this highest activity of this self is the natural acceptance right so to that consciousness is going to evolve it right. it is going to evolve by way of becoming aware of this highest activity of the self and then making this as the guidance for the lower activities of the self till then that evolution has to take place this uh yeah so this is what we are saying you know when it comes to unit of consciousness its form its structure is continuous in time however at the level of activities there may still be some change as far as activities of imagination is concerned it may keep changing unless it is guided by the higher level of activities particularly the activity of realization and we are accessing this in the form of natural acceptance right so there is permanence at the level of activity of realization further when it comes to space it is no activity therefore there is no possibility of change anyway so we are saying that this permanence this continuity is there in terms of structure when it comes to consciousness but in terms of activity there may still be change so there is a possibility of evolution and what is that possibility of evolution that i become you know awakened to this activity of highest activity of realization and then make this as the guide for the lower activities of the self then my process of self development will be completed okay anyway this is what i was saying so what uh, parasari ji is saying you know that there is still change in the level of consciousness yes it is true it is true till we have this activity of realization we are awakened to this activity of realization and that becomes the guide for all the lower activities of the self there will be you know change in the consciousness 
you know, at the level of activity of consciousness. So there will be this evolution taking place. Ji. Yeah. Take nature and we take space. Who is parent? Who is parasite here? Yeah. Yeah. So let me um, clarify, I mean, uh, two things. Number one, you know, we have a lot of this, you know, um, perspective. We already have, okay. And we see things through those perspectives. Now, when we are raising such issues here, then of course it is very disturbing. You know. So I can feel with you that, you know, what we are talking here is in one way helping us to things, you know, see things with more clarity. And on the other hand, it is also confusing because we have other sets of, you know, uh, perception already sitting in us. For example, when you say, you know, the, uh, when we are talking about the units, we are talking about the existence. And when we are talking about the space, we are talking about the absence. Right? And now this is one perception. What we are saying is different. We are saying that units are also reality and the space is also reality. Right? And we need to understand both. So space is not the absence. Space appears to be absence when you are focusing on the form of the unit. Right. So like that, you know, many things uh, uh, are there, you know, at the base of our perception. And when we are introduced to all these proposals, many times they uh, start raising questions uh, on those perceptions which we already have those assumptions which we already have so it is quite discomforting in that sense and i can feel with you you know about this I feel with what you are saying you know but i only have to add that you know we are talking about the world outside we are talking about the world inside you know we are talking about both and we are also talking about the space in which this world outside and inside you know is existing so uh, uh, we are talking about the whole existence, about the whole reality. Uh, but yes, the emphasis is more on this inner world, you know, because we, that has been neglected till now. But we are certainly talking about all that is there in existence and human existence. And we would like to have a continuity, a harmony at all levels. But it will take time. I, mean, I can understand that, you know. It will take time and we have to, you know, be with it with a lot of patience.